I'd like to invite your attention to the book of 2 Kings chapter 7. I want to read just a few verses of scripture in your hearing this evening. Thank you for your support of the word of God this week. Just every time the word of the Lord has been opened, there's just been a tremendous liberty. And I thank you for that. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 7 and verse 3. There were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. They rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites, the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight, let their tents and their horses, their asses, even their camp as it was, and fled for their life. When these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent, they did eat, they did drink, they carried thence silver and gold and raiment, went and hid it, came again, entered into another tent, carried thence also, and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now, therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. Verse 12. The king arose in the night, said unto his servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we be hungry. Therefore are they gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. Verse 14, They took therefore two chariot horses. The king sent after the host of the Syrians, saying, Go and see and they went after them unto Jordan, and lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels which the Syrians had cast away in their haste, and the messengers returned and told the king. I want to speak to you for just a few moments this evening on this subject. Expect the blessing. Expect the blessing. Could you look at your neighbor and tell them, just, just nudge them and say, it's time to start expecting the blessing of the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. Can we lift up our voice in prayer one more time? Lord, I thank you for your holy word. I thank you for the word of faith that we can speak into any set of circumstances. And I pray tonight that the word of faith will go forth. That the word of life will accomplish that whereto you have sent it. Help each of us to receive the word. Help each of us to believe it, to obey it to apply it and to rejoice in it we give you praise let your anointing flow deeply and mightily we pray in Jesus name and the church said in Jesus name and the church said amen oh let's clap our hands one more time unto God and shout with the voice of triumph hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth praise God you may be seated in Jesus name the word of the Lord tells us about an interesting exchange that occurs be between messengers and Herod the king. Herod was a wicked king in Jesus' day and in the day of John the Baptist. The messengers had come with good news. We call it the gospel. They came to let him know that there was a man who was performing great miracles. And their report was that the blind are seeing and that the deaf are hearing, that the lame are walking, that there are great miracles, that, that the king of the Jews has arrived in many people's estimation. This was as good a news as you can imagine there being. But it did not register with Herod as being good news. Herod's response was 
only three words. He said, it is John. Now, the reason that he jumped to that conclusion is because Herod was tormented by a deed he had done that he just simply could not overcome in his own mind. He was kind of caught up in the moment on a day that a dance of Herodias' daughter had pleased him. And the Bible says he offered whatever would be desired. And the request came back to his chagrin, to his utter shock, that the request was the head of John the Baptist in a charger. This young lady's mother was consulted as to what should the request be. And the request came back, the head of John the Baptist in a charger. Because John the Baptist dare preach against the adulterous relationship that her mother and the king were in. And this request was not what he had in mind. He was thinking material gain. He was thinking something of value, not something so cruel, not something so treacherous. But he had made the vow in front of everybody. And he had to come through with what he had promised. And so... John the Baptist lost his life that day when this request was made and Herod could not get over it. He was the one with blood on his hands. The blood of the great prophet that the scripture says there was no greater prophet than John the Baptist born born of women and yet Herod is guilty of the blood of this prophet and it haunted him it tormented him to the point that when he heard the good news that Jesus has come that he has come to lift the fallen from their fall that he has come to open the eyes of the blind and he has come to heal those that are broken he could not receive that as good news all he could think about was what he had done wrong But Herod, you are incorrect. It is not John. It is Jesus. And somebody here tonight needs to know that when you hear the great gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not John. It's Jesus. The devil would love to drag you down into an abyss of, of just thinking and toiling over all that you have done wrong. But but, but the reality is the Lord has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The reality is the healer is in the house. The reality is the Savior has come to save. The reality is the deliverer has come to deliver. The redeemer has come to redeem. There is a blessing of the Lord awaiting you. And we can be like Herod so many times that when the good news arrives, we can't think of the good news. We can't consider the good news. All we can consider is how much we don't deserve it. How nothing that good could ever come our way. But I want you to know it is God's desire to bless Each and every one of you. I'm talking to you and I'm talking to the person next to you. God wants to bless each and every person that is in this place. You hear me because I'm going to contend with those lies the devil is telling you. In Jesus name. God desires to bless. He desires to open the windows of heaven and bless you. He desires to give you good things. He desires for your life to be a life of utter peace and joy. Hallelujah. God desires to bless each and every one of us. To the point that we should expect the blessing, not the worst. But we're like Herod so many times. And I will not lie to you, okay? I won't mislead you. I'm not going to stand up here and say, well, you can live any old way you want to live and God's just going to bless you in spite of how you live. That's not how it works. It is true that sin is a preventative to the blessing of the Lord. See, God hates sin. 
And you've got to understand, God truly, genuinely, deeply hates sin. But he doesn't hate sin because he's a hater. He hates sin because sin separates us from him. In other words, God hates sin because he loves us. And if we'll get rid of the sin and he's the only one who has the power to actually cleanse us from our sin. But if we'll repent from it, turn from it, walk to him and say, Lord, I'm giving you every sin. I'm giving you every transgression. God, I need to hand my iniquity over to you. I want you to know that God, hallelujah, will forgive us of our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins you really do have to turn away from it I talked about it this morning I want to elaborate on it a little bit more because repentance is an actual turning away from your sin you have to walk away from it you can't continue in sin and expect to be blessed of the Lord your sin is preventing you from being blessed of God you remaining in sin, you justifying sin, you acting like God is perfectly fine with your sinful activities and sinful lifestyle. All of that is shutting the windows of heaven and it is preventing you from walking into and experiencing the blessing of the Lord. But if you will turn from your sin, hallelujah, God is just waiting so he can bless you like you've never been blessed so he can pour his absolute blessing upon every part of your life he wants to bless your mind he wants to bless your home he wants to bless your marriage he wants to bless your children he wants to bless your children's children hallelujah he wants to bless you coming and going he wants to bless you in the city bless you in the field hallelujah bless you in the highways and in the byways he wants to bless your words he wants to bless your actions he wants to bless your finances why would you continue to live in sin when you can be so blessed I want nothing to do with those sins I can't walk away fast enough they're not worth it Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ to be greater riches than all the treasures in Egypt. Hallelujah. God wants to bless us, but it does require repentance. I remember a man coming to our church in Kokomo, Indiana, uh, USA, where I grew up, and he came to the uh, front of the church at the altar call and he laid down on the altar pouring his heart out to God on a Easter Sunday morning and we were finishing up our service and he just poured out his heart to God he wept at that altar and and people left everybody left for the afternoon and came back for the Sunday evening service and he was still weeping at the altar because he was turning his life over to God. And he repented and he never went back to those sins. Now I want you to understand, you can cry and not repent. You can feel sorry for what you did and not repent. You, you have to actually turn. Hallelujah. The Bible says that if you regard iniquity in your heart, your prayers will not be heard by the Lord. The Bible said that if you're not, men, if you're not treating your wives right, your prayers are going to be hindered. You really truly do have to walk away from sin. And then you can ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door it shall be opened unto you God desires to bless you and I know I'm contending with with every lie the devil has ever told you he's given you all these reasons of why it might happen for somebody else but it won't happen for you why other people might deserve it other people might get lucky but but you will never have that experience in your life and that's many times the way we live our lives we even say things like well it'd be just my luck well, that's not how it happens for me. 
If one thing goes wrong, everything goes wrong. And, and we begin to look at our life through the prism of expecting the worst to actually occur when the opposite is true. God desires to bless you beyond what you could ever think or imagine. Hallelujah. But we have to expect the blessing. The prodigal son had walked away from his father. He took his inheritance early and he lives riotously in a heathen land, joined himself to a citizen of a foreign country and he lived a life of total debauchery, wasted his substance, gave it all away, spent it all. And while he lay in a, the Bible says, in a, a pigsty, receiving food that the pigs would not even eat. He lay there. It couldn't get any worse than it was. But while he sat there, he, the Bible says, came to himself. And the Bible says that he started thinking, the servants in my father's house have it better than what I have it right now. I will arise and go to my father's house and just ask him, can I at least be a servant? When he went to his father's house, his father was watching over the horizon and the prodigal son found something out about his father that he never knew. And I submit to you that if he had known this about his father, he would have never left in the first place. I'll tell you what, if you knew how good God really is, you would never go back to this world. If you knew how gracious and how loving and how kind he really is. You would never go to a world that'll let you down every chance it gets. He was shocked. He was surprised. But his father said, you are not my servant. You are my son. I'm going to tell you something. You would be shocked if you knew how much God wants to bless you. You would be surprised if you understood that you're not just another person. You've repented. You've turned your heart to him. You've been buried in his name, filled with his spirit. And if you haven't, tonight would be a good night to experience it because God wants to bless you. Oh, let me remind somebody, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. Hallelujah. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Hallelujah. You, you have to know that God desires to bless you. The Bible says that these four leprous men were sitting outside the camp of the Syrians. And they said, you know what? We're in the middle of this famine. We have leprosy. We're in a bad position. And we're going to sit here until, until we die. And they said, why sit we here till we die? We might as well go into the camp of the Syrians and at least beg for mercy. And let them know, my goodness, if, if you could just have mercy on us. We're hungry. And they said, well, one of them said they might kill us. Well, yeah, they're going to kill us. Of course they're going to kill us. But they said, we're going to die here anyway. So we might as well try. So they got up and they went into the camp of the Syrians and they were expecting the worst. But when they got there, something strange happened. There was nobody to let them in, nobody to welcome them, no welcome center table, no registration. The whole place was like a ghost town except it looked like people were living there. The camp of the Syrians was completely unoccupied, but all the food was there, all the drink was there, all the cattle was there, all the gold was there, all the silver was there. They walked into one tent, and there, were, there, was, there was so much food, they ate till their heart was content. They went into the next tent, and it was the same. Finally, they, they, they had so engorged themselves with food and drank themselves Silly, and they looking at one another with just, with just absolute bounty and abundance. And they said, this isn't even right. Here we are in the middle of this famine and, and, and we've been eating and drinking all of, this, all of this blessing. They didn't even know what had happened. But here's what happened. The Lord had caused the Syrian army to hear in the middle of the night 
a host of chariots and horses. And the Syrian army heard the noise of the horses and they heard the noise of the chariots and they rose up and fled because they thought it was the army of the Egyptians and the army of the Hittites. Somebody said, well, God let them hear something that wasn't even there. I would disagree with that because I believe the Lord let them hear what was there. Except it wasn't the Egyptians and it wasn't the Hittites. It was the angel armies of the Lord. Because I'm going to tell you something. When the people of God go into battle, they don't go into battle by themselves. I want you to know, my goodness, see, you don't even know how blessed you are. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear the Lord. My God. You don't even know how blessed you are, but he's above you and beneath you, and he's on either side of you. He encompasses you. He undergirds you. He overshadows you. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to, I'm going to speak for me today. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Every day that I live, I am blessed. God doesn't owe me one thing, but in his grace and in his mercy and in his loving kindness, he pours out blessings upon me. My God, I'm blessed. My wife is blessed. My kids are blessed. My grandbaby's blessed. The church I pastor is blessed. The city where I live is blessed. It's blessing, blessing, blessing. My God. They heard the hosts of God move out across and beside them and the bible says they mistook it for the egyptians or the hittites and they got up and fled and they left all their goods they abandoned all of their money and all of their food and now here these leprous men are walking from tent to tent they got tim hortons in one tent hey amen i think i've mentioned tim hortons every time i've preached this weekend I love it that there's one everywhere you look. We have two in Ohio that I know of. Amen. They had Chick-fil-A in another tent. Everywhere they looked. Food, blessing, silver, gold, bounty, abundance, blessing, blessing. They said, we do not well. We need to go tell somebody. So they went and they told the king. And when they told the king, the king arose in the night leaning against his wall and he's listening to this story from his messengers and his messengers are saying four leprous men have sent word that the Syrians have abandoned their camp and that the spoils are there for the taking and that we have all the food we want in the middle of a famine all the, all the drink we want all the silver and all the gold everything we would ever want it's there and the king is listening and that old king who had been around the block a few times that old king who had experience said, you said that all the food is there and all the money's there? Yeah, all the tents are empty of people but not of wealth? No. He said, uh-huh. <laughs> I'll tell you exactly what the Syrians are doing. I may have been born at night, but it wasn't last night. I'll tell you exactly what the Syrians are doing. And he started doing what we always do. There's got to be a string attached there's got to be some kind of a, of a fine print. The devil is in the details. There's got to be some kind of fine print we're missing. And I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen. We're going to load up and we're going to go down to that camp and the Syrians are going to be hiding out somewhere and they're going to jump out when we least expect it. And he started to rationalize the way we always rationalize. Where's it going to go wrong? This is too good to be true. This could never happen for me. I could never be blessed like that. My whole family could never be saved. My children would never be able to serve the Lord. And, and, and my finances could never multiply. And, and, and he just started to think it could never happen for me. But I rebuke that thinking in the name of Jesus. 
My God have mercy. It is time that you stand upon the rock solid truth of the promises of God and understand that if God be for us, who can be against us? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. No weapon that is formed against me can prosper. I am blessed of the Lord and there's nothing that the devil can do about it. Ah, my God. They went riding along and the whole time they're wondering, when is the next shoe going to drop? When is the, is the gig going to be up? When is the, is the bad stuff going to start happening? But here's the thing about the blessing of the Lord. Stop expecting the worst and start expecting the blessing. Hallelujah. You trying to tell me, preacher, that nothing bad happens? No, 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 no. I'm trying to tell you that even if something bad happens, it will bless you. See, I am covered by the blood of Jesus. And anything that comes against me to enter into my world, it has to come through the blood of Jesus Christ. And by the time it comes through the blood, it is sanctified. It is cleansed. It is blessed. So even the thing meant to harm me has to work in coordination with the blessing of the Lord for my good. There is nothing that can enter my world that isn't for my good. All things work together for the good to them that love God. And my God, can I preach it like I feel it? It doesn't happen for just anybody. It happens for them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. I don't know how. I, I don't know how to explain it. But even the bad stuff becomes a blessing. Even the things that don't go the way you want them to go, they become a blessing. That's what Joseph tried to tell his brothers. He said, you meant it for evil, but God turned it. Woo, hallelujah. You meant it for evil, but I'm blessed. So there is no evil that has any power over me. You meant it for evil, but I'm blessed. So God turned it for the good. I'm going to tell you, he'll turn that sickness for the good. My God, he'll, he'll take the bad past you have and he'll turn it for the good. That is how good, let me tell you how good God is. God is so good that the moment you give your life to him, he takes everything that ever happened and one by one he sanctifies it. All of it, all of it, all of it, all of it, all of it. All of it becomes good in that moment. All of it. Even the terrible stuff, it starts working together for the good. In a few weeks we're going to have Brother Nick Mahaney in Cincinnati preach. He's preached for us before. He's the son of a great preacher of the gospel who has gone on to be with the Lord. Nick Mahaney spent his life away from God, rebelling against his father's message of, of Jesus. And he spent years in drugs and drug dealing. Spent years in crime. He spent years in prison. He, he was due to face 48 plus years in prison. And then he gave his life to God. You say, well, well, I mean, the deed is done. There's nothing, I mean, what can even God do with something like that? I don't know how to explain it. But God went back and took every experience Nick Mahaney ever had and sanctified it for his glory. Now he's able, Nick Mahaney's able to take the bad stuff and hold it up and say, this is what God delivered me from. And anybody and everybody who's dealing with the kind of stuff Nick used to deal with, my God, they walk into a new faith into a new dimension of expectation God can turn what the devil meant for evil 
God can turn it for the good. I expect to be blessed. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We were in the middle of our building program. 2018 was the greatest year of my pastorate. It was the most remarkable year. We had launched our campaign. We started giving. I shared some of the testimonies last night. The people were giving. There was so much faith flowing. There was so much goodness flowing. Everybody loved each other. Everybody was giving to God's cause. Everything was so good. And I thought, man, I didn't know pastoring could be so easy. And I thought, man, I wish I'd have arrived at this point a long time ago. This is great. I don't think I'll ever stop right where I am. I'll just stay right here and let it always be like this. 2019, we applied for our permit to build. Little did I know that all of the devil's plans were going to unleash on us. And they rose up against us. People are in the surrounding area rose up against us. And they since have apologized for it. But, but at the time, they were absolutely opposed. And they came against us. And, and it was a year long that it took us to achieve our building permit. And it was so bad. I remember I was sitting, I was sitting in one meeting. And, and I thought, you know, I thought I would talk to some of them and just let them know the good we're trying to do. And let them know that it's in everybody's interest for us to be able to build this building. It'll be such a blessing to everybody. And I thought, hey, I know what I'll do. I'll just go down, knock on the door, and I'll lay on the old charm. The old charm didn't work. <laughs> and they rose up against us. I remember one particular meeting. There was a man who literally looked back at me and snarled at me and growled at me and, 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 and cut his eyes at me. And it, it was one of those things where if looks could kill, it was a, it was a very hostile environment. And, and I remember in that moment that I felt the Lord just kind of come down. It started to feel hopeless and helpless. And I felt the Lord just kind of come down and whisper to me. He said... I'm not going to let you care about this anymore. And when he said that, all of the cares lifted off of my shoulders. And I was left with the feeling of, I don't care. It was a little alarming, I have to tell you. Because I genuinely did not care anymore. I didn't, they, somebody else got up and, and, and insulted us and I didn't care. And they were talking about maybe we wouldn't get the permit. And I thought, I don't care. <laughs> I stopped caring. I looked at the Lord and said, Lord, is it okay that I don't care this much? Is it even okay? Because I know you did it, but I'm kind of worried. I really, I don't care. And the Lord began to show me what care really means in the scriptures. We've elevated it to the word love, and it doesn't mean love. Cares are worries. Cares are distractions. Cares are burdens. And the cares of this life will choke out what God is trying to develop inside of us. And when the Bible said, "He, if, if you will cast your cares upon him, he will care for you. We think that means cast your cares on him because he loves you. And that's not what he's saying. He does love you, but that's not what he's saying in that verse. He's saying, cast your cares upon the Lord and the Lord will do the caring for you. You don't have to care anymore. You don't have to worry or fret or doubt. You just, my God, you just expect God to bless you. You just keep trucking. You just keep plotting. Even if you don't feel like you're getting anywhere, just keep on keeping on. The blessing is coming. The blessing is coming. I expect the blessing of the Lord. Well, don't, well, didn't you hear what they said about you? I don't care. Don't you know how much opposition? I really don't care. I expect God to bless us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, toward the end of it, there was a, a letter that came, and it, it was from the city, and they said, there's a letter on your desk from the city waiting for you. I got to the office and I thought, I don't even want to open it. It can't be good news. There's just, just nothing good coming. Is there any good thing going to come out of Nazareth? 
And I thought, I thought there's just, there's just, I don't even want to open, but I have to. So, so I opened the letter. I braced myself, took a big deep breath and thought, all right, let's have the bad news. And when I opened it up, it said, Dear Reverend Urshan and Tree of Life Church, we're so thankful you're part of our community. Thank you for the time you invest in our city. Thank you for the service and the volunteer hours that the people bring to the community. It's such a blessing, and we are so glad that you are here. And I'm reading this, and I thought, huh, not what I was expecting. <laughs> and that's actually where this message was born. The Lord spoke to me in that moment and said, stop expecting the worst and start expecting the blessing." My God, I know you're up against something right now, but stop expecting the worst and start expecting the blessing. I know, listen, I know you've got a difficult past, but it's time to turn it all over to Jesus and stop expecting the worst and start expecting the blessing. I don't know what doctor's visit you've got coming up. I don't know what court date you've got coming up, but you need to lay that thing down at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, I depend on you and I expect your grace to intervene hallelujah somebody lift your hands to him would you lift your hands to him would you lift your hands to him glory hallelujah glory hallelujah ha 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 woo My God, my God, my God. My God, you ought to dance like the blessing's coming. You ought to dance like the weight has been lifted. You ought to shout. I said you ought to shout like the chains have been broken. My God, don't wait till the battle's over. Shout now. Shout now. God, nobody else can see it, but there's a blessing coming. There's a blessing coming. I don't need somebody's permission to believe God for the blessing. <laughs> Woo! Glory. <laughs> yeah. Somebody ought to break out of their seat and dance down this aisle and say it's the blessing. It's the blessing. I believe it's coming. I believe it's coming. I put my faith in God and he's going to bless me. Come on. Let the Lord rebuke the devourer. Let him open the windows of heaven upon your life. That's it, dance. That's it, shout. That's it, give him praise. I want somebody that's been battling some depression. I want you to throw those chains off of you. Hallelujah. And praise God for the blessing of joy. I want somebody that's been worrying about something so much and for so long. It's time to praise God. It's time to give Him glory. It's time to expect the blessing of the Lord.
Yeah. Come on, dance like the weight has been lifted. He did it. He did it. Dance like the chains have been broken. He did it. My God. My God. Glory. Glory. That's the sound of joy. That's the sound of faith. I said, that's the sound of joy. That's the sound of faith in God. Oh, <laughs> My God. My God. Our musicians can come. The last time that Jacob saw Esau, Esau vowed to kill him. Jacob ran for his life. Now he was trying to come back to Esau. He didn't know what to expect. He expected the worst. He expected that Esau was going to come through on his vow to kill him. And when he saw Esau from a far ways off, Somebody said he's got 400 men with him. Jacob knew this was certain death. He expected the worst. He, he bowed himself seven times in front of Esau. You know why Jacob expected the worst? Because Jacob had something in his life he regretted and he was still tormented by it. But when he got to Esau, what he didn't know is that the whole time God was working it out with Esau. And Esau had no hate in his heart. He had no malice in his heart. And what Jacob expected as the worst turned out to be a blessing. His brother Esau ran to him, hugged him, said, you're my brother. You're my brother. I want relationship with you. That thing you've been fearing, that thing you've been dreading, you hear the word of the Lord and embrace it in Jesus' name. God is already working it out on your behalf. You're afraid of what you're going to find. You're afraid of what's going to turn out. But I've come to declare to you the word of God. God is on the other side, fixing it, healing it, working it out, giving you joy and blessing. 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 Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply you. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. Every place you step your foot, you're going to be blessed. Woo! I want somebody that believes it. I want you to begin to praise God from down deep inside. I want somebody to dance, shout, leap, run. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Dance like the chains have been broken. Hey, hold on, hold on. We're getting ready to sing. We're getting ready to sing and give God praise. And I thank God for all that are dancing before the Lord up here. But are these the only people that God has done something for? Are these the only ones that have faith? Are these the only ones who are believing God for a blessing? I want everybody in this house to praise God like he just blessed you because you expect. I want you to praise him like you just got the call. Everything's going to be all right. I want you to praise him like you just got the text that they've decided to turn their heart back to God all across this house. Woo! Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him.